When you forget something, where does the memory go? What exactly happens inside your brain? Does it just sort of drift out your ear? Uh, that's the question at the heart of a new study led by neuroscientists in China and published today in the journal Science. The researchers suggest that a particular kind of brain cell plays a key role in the forgetting process by breaking down the physical connections in the brain that form memories. The ABC Science Editor, Dr Jonathan Webb, is with me this morning. Good morning to you. Morning, Hamish. How do you tackle a question like this? How do you observe memories as they come and go from the brain? Well, there's a couple of ways you might set about trying to to watch this happen and unpick the process. You might start with humans, those of us, you know, we, we experience memories and we can talk about them, so that's one... To just put a camera on us as we walk to the fridge, open the door and then realise that we couldn't remember what we were going where, there to get. Where am I? What was I looking for? Yeah, or, or indeed get us to lie down and put us in a giant magnet like a brain scanner and try and see which bits of the brain are more active when we're remembering something or forgetting something and try and unpick things that way. And brain scans are getting better and better and we are getting a handle on some of these processes using those systems. The other way is to take a much a much simpler system, like a mouse in a box. And that's what was at the heart of this study. It was done on mice. And little tiny fridges. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did I come to the fridge for? No, it's it's a really simple type of memory that's often at the core of some of these studies called a contextual fear memory. So if you put a mice in a specific box and you give it a a faintly unpleasant experience, right? Some gentle electric shocks. Uh, and then a few days later, you put it back in the same box, it'll freeze. It'll spend a, cer a certain amount of time pretty much frozen to the spot because it's anxious. It remembers that sort of anxious memory. But if you do it several weeks later, and in this study, it was 35 days as opposed to five days in the first instance, that'll happen a lot less because that memory has started to fade uh, and the mouse will no longer freeze so much when it goes back into that same location. So the next thing that they did was shut down the activity of this particular type of brain cell that they were interested in uh, called microglia. And when they blocked off the way that those microglia were working in the part of the brain where we're pretty sure that type of fear memory is being formed, then on that 35 day later window, uh, the, the mice were still freezing, right? So where you would normally see a big drop-off in that freezing behaviour over that kind of few weeks period, um, if you shut off these particular cells, that drop-off doesn't happen to the same extent. So some of that forgetting hasn't happened and they're still remembering that they had a nasty experience in that box five weeks earlier. So, so what are the microglia doing? Well, they're a really interesting type of brain cell. They belong to a group of cells that have usually been thought of as being support cells in the brain. So they're not the neurons which do the, which I guess are the pathways and the wires and the junctions that we think of as, as doing the thinking and the laying down of memories in the brain. They do things like maintain the balance of chemicals and microglia in particular are an immune cell. So they can wander around and gobble up things that shouldn't be there and that might cause disease. We also know that in the very early days of the brain, when we're learning a lot and when the new connections that lay down memories and behaviours are growing and growing and growing a bit too much, they grow and grow like weeds to begin with, these microglia are actually prune those synapses, those new connections that are forming, they're involved in whittling them down so that we don't get too many. So these guys were interested in whether, in whether that type of thing was also happening in the grown-up brain when we're forming these connections to create memories. And, and uh, forgive me if this is not a clever question, but do we think or do these scientists think that it's the same thing that will make you forget something in the moment? Quite simple, like why did I walk into this room or what was I about to say? But I think it's the same bit of the brain that's uh, working then or not working as when you actually forget something from a long time ago. I'm just asking because of the experiments on the mice and the, the short period versus the longer period. Yeah, that's a really good question. So this, this study centred on a bit of the brain called the hippocampus, uh, which in you and me sits about an inch and a half in from the ear. It's a bit more central in the mouse brain and we know that's involved in the memory process, but in particular in that, that earlier stage. So while, you know, for a few days or a week or so, you'll kind of remember that something happened maybe in a particular place, we're pretty sure that a lot of those connections are made in the hippocampus. It's also involved in helping us navigate space. So in particular, memories that have a, a spatial component are associated with the hippocampus. But the broad idea is that over a longer term, 
um, the, the memories that are really important and maybe that we go back to the hippocampus and we access a few times so that the connections get stronger, then they get kind of filed away to other bits of the brain. So the hippocampus, some neuroscientists say, might function a bit like a, a librarian, whereas the rest of the big outer coating of the brain, the cortex, might help as more of a library where the um, those much longer term memories, things you remember from when you were a kid uh, or from when you learned them at, you know, at university, they might be filed away in, in kind of slightly more distant hard drives, so if you like. why do we want to know this? Well, the function of these microglia could be really important and interesting. It's a, there are other ideas about how the cellular process of, processes of forgetting might work. This is a and kind of a new idea that these immune cells are basically chewing up connections uh, that have formed a memory that maybe we haven't used in a few weeks so we don't need. So they're kind of not just doing a, a maintenance-type gardening, they're kind of actually maintaining the circuits that we need versus the ones that we don't. Um, and microglia also exist in the human brain. And because they have this role in kind of keeping the circuits under control, they've been implicated in quite a few different diseases from things like Alzheimer's that are specifically involved in memory to even kind of autism and depression and things that involve circuits either not acting or storing things in the right way or being too active or overgrown. So there's a, a real potential in understanding more about how microglia work and some of the, the best ways to get an early handle on their primary role in things like memory is uh, in mouse experiments. Okay. Uh, let's go from brains to icebergs. The biggest iceberg, the iceberg in the world, it's being reported by the BBC that a huge chunk of ice known as A68 uh, is soon going to leave Antarctic waters heading north. How big is it? What's going to happen next? It's about 6,000 square kilometres. So it's uh, around about the size of Kangaroo Island, or at least that's what it was um, two or three years ago. So in July 2017, you may remember talk of the Larsen Sea ice shelf, which is in West Antarctica on the side of the big uh, Antarctic peninsula that reaches up towards South America. We were watching from space and from aeroplanes as this crack gradually inched along this shelf and eventually this chunk, now known as A68, broke off. Uh, and for about a year or so after that in 2017, it didn't really move anywhere. But then it did start to kind of track a path along the side of this peninsula and this last summer... In particular, satellite observations have shown it's starting to, to speed up. So it hasn't shrunk much yet, but it is getting towards the end of that peninsula and will kind of enter much rougher waters soon. And so it will start probably to, to break up. It's remarkably thin, so you wouldn't think it would take much to break up. A, a scientist that was quoted by the BBC said that the kind of length to thickness ratio of this thing that is basically the size of Kangaroo Island is like a few sheets of A4 paper, right? So it's not very thick for how much of the ocean it's covering. Okay, incredible. Jonathan Webb, thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Hamish.